All right, we are now live and recording. So my name is Matt Beckman. I am the Managing Director of Ascent Consultants. And today I am joined by Joe Golterman, CPA and CFA of Ruben Brown. They are a multi-service accounting and consulting firm based out of St. Louis. Joe, thanks for taking Yes, thank you very call. much for uh, having me, Matt. Uh, look forward to our conversation. Yeah, I know. Um, do you want to take a minute, tell us a little bit about what you do at Ruben Brown, a little self plug, and then we can dive in? Or do you want to jump in and save the shameless plug for the end? Let's just save that for the end. All right, sounds good. Well, Joe, I know one thing on a lot of people's minds is the Paycheck Protection Stimulus Act. And right. I know myself as a lawyer and you as a CPA, we're limited in what we can really say specifically in terms of advice that we give. But from your experience, you know, what are you, what are you seeing from some of your clients and hearing from some of your colleagues about just some big picture things related to the PPP, um, the SBA's role, the role of banks, the role of accountants, lawyers, like, you know, what do we, what do we seem like we're doing well and where can we, where can we improve? Yeah, so I've seen, uh, so the PPP loan runs through banks. Um, so having people have a, a banker that is a real contact um, is, has been very beneficial to the majority of our clients. Um, so that, that's been the main, the main thing to actually have a real banker or uh, a consultant to call and talk to during this time to see if the loan is advantageous for them to take and to then understand the mechanics of the loan and why they're taking on the loan. Okay. And I think that goes to the heart of, you know, two major questions that a lot of people have are, you know, is this right for me and what are my other options? Mm -hmm. And I know when you and I were preparing for this, one thing that we sort of began to draw some distinctions was the, the big one being, you know, you said a, a real banker, um, but then also, you know, a, a tax preparer versus a CPA, um, you know, a, retained counsel versus a lawyer that you've worked with in the past, you know, um, are you seeing that a lot of people are beginning to draw these distinctions between some of their own service providers? I think so. Um, yeah, I think they're reaching out for questions and, uh, and really seeing the distinction of someone who's really trying to answer their questions and, and help their business versus uh, just hunkering down and, you know, like you said, either trying to get out tax returns or, you know, focusing on those things that you can push off and really just really focus on the small business people during their time of need. Okay. Yeah. And I, I've heard some stories myself from my network. One comes to mind, um, you know, they're a, they're a startup, uh, not located here in Texas, but located in the Midwest. And, um, you know, they're working with a big bank and the big bank, like a lot of folks at the outset, really, you know, they didn't really have all the mechanics put together, you know, the, the top down policies and procedures for how to handle this crush of application. And, you know, they were very close to switching banks because they really felt that, why are we going with a big bank if we're just going to get lost in the shuffle? Now, ultimately, the bank that they worked with, you know, they managed to make the situation right and they were able to secure these funds. Um, yeah. For those folks who are still out there trying to, you know, trying to grope through the darkness and figure some things out, what would be just one quick piece of advice that you have for people that are out there trying to determine what their options are? Well, if they already have not applied for the loan, I would say definitely gather your information and apply for the loan if you think it's a good loan for yourself. And, and the loan basically helps pay for your payroll during this this time frame, and and some of it can also pay for some rent and interest and utilities also during this time frame as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And you know, I, I working having worked in government myself and worked with the the state auditor for over a year. Um, my one piece of advice would be if you do proceed, make sure, like Joe said, you understand that this is the correct option for you, and then. Make sure that just from a general perspective, you're talking with your accountant and your lawyer. Make sure that you have a full understanding of what compliance means and how you can use this loan. Because 
there will be people knocking on doors after the fact, wanting to know where this money went. And, you know, you need to be able to back it up if you're going to be able to look for that favorable treatment. Right. The, the first mad rush was, I just need to get this money in the door. Right. The, the next will be, you need to understand the forgiveness portion or else yeah. it just turns into a loan and to really right. get a handle on that and what you need to do um, for that to actually get the loan fully forgiven. Right. Or at least partially forgiven. Okay. Yeah. So our takeaways, folks, for the PPP are one, talk with your attorney, talk with your accountant, talk with your resources. If they're not able to give you the answers that you need or help you through this process, then perhaps it's time to reconsider who you're working with and whether or not they're the best fit for your business. And then once you do take this money, make sure, stay in touch with those accountants and lawyers and make sure that you're doing your work on the compliance side. This is not free money, that's for sure. So don't, uh, don't mistake it as such. Um, all right, so Joe, shifting gears a little bit, um, a big part of my practice is uh, leadership and management. And I know being a sole proprietor with a small team, it's pretty easy for me to jump on the phone with clients or you know, arrange meetings, but you're in a large organization. I, I think you said that there are 800 people in your office. Right. Now all working remotely. What are some of the, what are some of the shifts in management that you've seen to try to help accommodate people who may be homeschooling and, you know, managing, managing a homestead and the children and trying to work and juggle all these balls in the air. What, uh, what changes on the management side have you seen uh, as a result of some of these uh, societal changes from COVID? I think communication is, as it, as it was key before, I think it's even more key now. Got it. Uh, Got it. Both broad communication at the whole firm level, just letting people know everything, what's going on, no and then on the individual level, just touching base with people, uh, not only on smaller groups, but then also on one-to-one to, to understand where everyone is, especially during this, this process where you're just all working remotely. Okay. So kind of three pieces to that. Um, take them one at a time. Uh, tell me a little bit about from the corporate level. Have you seen... Have you seen the frequency or the, the content of those communications really change as people have shifted to remote work? I think at the, at the very top level, the communication to everyone is, has been consistent, okay. um, has been broad, um, and it's, it's been good. It's been, it's been letting everyone know where everything stands, um, and obviously, as things change, then they update that. Okay. communication um, as that rolls forward. Okay. And I know with, with the role that you all are playing, you know, CPAs, consultants, financial advisors, you're really probably seeing rapid changes, not just day by day, but in some cases, maybe hour by hour. Right. Uh, some of it just has to do with, you know, what the state allows us to do, you know, going to the office or sure. the, the place of employment even being open. Right. So a lot of stuff is just still dictated by, by that. Okay. And then at the, the lower levels, you know, so you said at the, the, the C-suite level, you know, communicating with the company, the big things have been consistency and clarity, understanding what we're right. doing, what we're capable of doing, why we're doing it, and then, of right. course, keeping your people abreast of changes. Um, Zoom has become kind of the go-to forum for managers to help with their teams, sure. meeting with clients, things like that. How have you adjusted or how have you seen your team make adjustments to this forum, moving away from the, you know, the in-person, um, you know, spending less time on the road, seeing clients and more time for sure. virtual suites? Well, I, th I think Zoom is, is great. I think people, you are forced to almost learn it instantaneously where we, we had to, we had Zoom available to us and no one really knew how to use it or what it really was. Uh, so we pretty much instantly learned Zoom uh, on the fly. And I, I think it's been great. I think it's shown not only us, but every other uh, company that I've talked to that actually has meetings like this, that you don't need to go fly across the country or even that you don't need uh, your office in one location that you actually can do all this work from home and have real meetings uh, face to face or via Zoom like this 
and have it be as productive as a face-to-face -face meeting. I think that's that's a, a lot in there to unpack. And you know, the, the work world we come back to will be very different. Um, but I think the big thing there is sort of the, the mindset around effectiveness and working from home. And I think absent a tool like Zoom, definitely that effectiveness would be far less. And we'd see a very different public sentiment towards working if we didn't have these types of tools. Um, but it you know, really does raise the question of what does something like Zoom and work from home do to changing individual office cultures as well as long-term company planning, you know? Right. How big of an office do we need? Um, you know, what are the what are the new trends and the new advantages that we can you know that we can capture to improve you know overall you know reduction in expenses without necessarily something everybody's going to have to do. Look at their costs coming out of this. Remote work is definitely going to be something that if you haven't already considered, I think it's in there. Um, on the one-on-one -on -one level, um, and this is something very interesting for me, uh, you know, we're all dealing with a crush of emotions and very different individual scenarios with what COVID and all these changes have done to our, our lives. Um, what recommendations do you have on that one-on-one -on -one level for making sure that your team does maintain its effectiveness? What should a manager be doing with their individual team members to, to help navigate this? Right. I, I think, again, communication is, is key and not only communication with your smaller team, but also consistent communication individually with your uh, team members, just asking yeah. them how they're doing, how you can help. You know, you can't just walk down the hall anymore and ask a question. Uh, some people may be hesitant to call, call up the person at, uh, above them to ask them a question. So, keeping that, those lines of communication open um, is, is still key. And to just actively engage in those lines of communication, not wait for the people to seek you out. I think that's a real good point. A proactive, not reactive management right now. You know, um, I think managers probably have it the toughest. You know, Reporting upwards, managing downwards, you know, the guy in the middle, the gal in the middle, whatever, you know, whatever that position might be. Um, and I think one of the things you pointed out where, you know, you've seen clear, consistent messaging moving up and down the chain. And, you know, I think that that goes a long way to right. minimizing issues and, you know, snuffing them out early, nipping them in the bud. If you have somebody that proactively is saying, Joe, what accommodations do you need? How has this change been impacting you? What's working? What's not? Right. Um, you know, for me, one of the biggest things, uh, talking with some people who are in leadership, uh, what was one of the big things you learned about leadership through your career? And for me, and this I think is super relevant now, is that especially in times of uncertainty, a leader's job should be more removing obstacles than trying to be the source of all the answers and all the direction. You know. It's, it's going to take a village and knowing, you know, communicating to your team and communicating upwards to your C-suite so that decisions can be made with more perspective, uh, I think is really big. One other thing that I'll mention, and you can maybe comment on this, um, meetings in Zoom, how you set those agendas. Uh, I was reading the Harvard Business Review the other day and I, I've done this a little bit in my past life, but I'm definitely going to adopt it now because I think it's just far more effective in terms of running a quick, concise meeting, especially on Zoom when we all kind of get burned out and have the tendency to maybe drift off. But um, making your agenda around questions rather than vague topics, like rather than saying, how do we solve these budget issues? How do we reduce our costs by five to $10,000? And give these people the ability to step in and answer that question, not just provide vague commentary on, well, the budget, like we should work to control our costs. Right. Okay. Specifically, you know, this, for me, this is, this is designed at two levels that in a lot of ways could be missing. One manager is just asking for, give us info, give us all your best ideas, trying to sort through that collage of information uh, versus also saying, Hey, if we can save this 5,000, 
we will have hit a goal. We can take this off our plates. We can move forward. It won't be one of these, all right, we're going to come back to this next week and the week after and the week after. So what are your thoughts on arranging those agendas around, you know, very specific, actionable questions versus maybe the, the vague topics that are used to kill time and fill space? I, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I agree that having a, those questions formed in that, in that way would actually be a more productive um, meeting where it wouldn't just be, you know, shooting from the hip on, on some of those vague questions, like you said. So I, I totally agree with what you said. Okay. Eloquent in its brevity. I love being completely agreed with. So Joe, just kind of to close out here, we'll spend a few minutes, you know, general, you know, I'll give, you know, I'll, I'll re up the disclaimer here that this is, this is just Joe and I providing general commentary, specific questions, these, you know, these forward looking statements about what we think the world is going to look like. This is just speculation on our part. So, you know, all the, all the relevant disclaimers about not relying on this, this is just discussion specifics. Joe's a CPA and a CFA. If you have specifics, he'll tell you how to reach him. I'll be posting this. We'll have contact information. Please, if you have specifics, reach out. Don't just take this as gospel because there are so many nuances to every situation. Um, those really need to be addressed. Accountants, lawyers, use those resources, use them wisely. Don't make, don't make, you know, blind leap of faith decisions right now. It won't end well. But Joe, after, you know, Texas is starting to reopen. Uh, tomorrow is the 1st of May and that marks phase two. We're gonna start seeing restaurants and movie theaters sure. and shopping malls. Um, what, what does the new normal potentially look like or what are some of the trends that you might think the shifts that we'll see in the corporate world coming out as more and more states and municipalities start to reopen and try to restart the economic engines? Joe, you still with us? Yeah, it kind of blurred out. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat my question then. So just looking forward, um, you know, speaking with your, your clients and things like that, what are some of the trends that we might be seeing in terms of, you know, in addition to work remote and work from home? Sure. What other trends, what other sort of general advice might be out there for people who are looking for ways to adapt when their city, municipality, when they're able to reopen? What should they be doing now to be ready for that? Be honest, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know what any of us will really expect um, when everything reopens. I think that we think that we'll maybe go back to normal, but in reality, even though they flip on the switch and say, "Hey, we're back. We're back open," I don't know what that really means. I don't know. I don't think people will really just go back um, to what they were doing before. Um, oh, I, I think they'll, they'll start to. Um, eventually, like, but even just in a, a giant office building, I think there will be some people hesitant to go back into a giant office building with hundreds and hundreds of people, you sure. know, getting in there, going in the exact same elevator, um, yeah. things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the traffic in and out of, you know, who gross, but your office restrooms, you know, a, a men's room that may be designed to handle a hundred people on a floor throughout right. a given day. You know, the, you know, I, I think the two big trends that we're definitely going to see are going to be the work from home and the, the give and take that employers probably need to be prepared for. Yeah. Um, you know, some schools we've heard aren't going to be going back into session until the fall. So what, right. you know, how do you accommodate people that now maybe aren't comfortable putting children in childcare and continuing to homeschool? So employers be flexible with that work from home. Probably good advice, right? Yeah, but I think you're right. I think we'll see it. We'll see it. We'll see it beginning a trickle. You know, speaking with some folks down here, some colleagues of mine, one friend of mine, fellow yoga teacher, she's like, well, <laughs> 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 you're good. See, and this, you know, this, this is a perfect example of the situations that we've got to deal with in this, this new work from home. Bring the kids in. I think we're gonna have to pause the. Uh... <laughs> recording for the moment. I care sometimes.
Well, and I, I, I don't know if you planned that or not, but <laughs> as we were talking about the push and pull of you know, working from home with kids, if you, if you notice the blip in the recording, it's because Joe quickly had to take off his parent or his, his work hat and put on his parenting hat. So again, employers, I, I think this is just perfect timing example, flexibility of your work from home and your accommodations and whether or not that includes children. Like I was saying, one of my yoga teaching colleagues, you know, the fitness industry is definitely one that will be forever changed. These huge packed group classes, you know, I, I can't see those going forward even when full restrictions are eventually lifted. And so her comment was, well, I live with an immunocompromised grandparent. I can't go into studio and then feel comfortable coming back home, potentially, you know, putting that grandparent at risk. And so, damn, we have, we have so much ground to cover when we come back out of this. Um, so yeah, the work from home, the, the push and pull of, you know, accommodating within reason your employees. Um, risk management, another area that I deal with frequently and uh, I know you're familiar with, but it strikes me that coming out of this, uh, a lot of companies not only looking at, all right, is my accountant and my attorney and, you know, my other resources, are they getting me the things that I need? But Joe, what about, force majeure and insurance and taking a look at, you know, the documents you use to govern your business. Um, do we start planning for the next lockdown? Yeah, I think you just, you have to look at everything in, in front of you and, and make sure that it's, it works for your business and, and try to understand all the risks out there. Obviously this was not a, a known risk out there. Um, and you know everything that you plan for usually doesn't happen. It's the unknown that usually happens. But uh, to just understand everything that you do have in place and what it does cover. What does your business insurance cover? What do you want it to cover? And make sure you understand all those items. Okay. And then for businesses that you know retail opening back up and seeing how that's going to change. Um, a couple of things we've talked about where you know effective and consistent communication and then flexibility um if i if i was running a retail operation right now and trying to get people to come back into my business uh now i guess the big questions on my mind would be how do i communicate to people that i am open for business and then more important to that how do i communicate to these people that their safety is still my first priority when they're in you know when they're at my business um, and I don't know that I have any good answer for that other than, you know, have your hand sanitizer and, you know, be proactive in terms of, you know, setting appropriate policies for your business, for your employees. There, there are many, many moving parts to all of this. And as people are somewhat reticent to come back out, you know, I think the businesses that will be successful will be the ones that, like you said, accurate consistent and concise communication in terms of you know this is why we're open for business and this is how we're working to protect our customers uh, right. any comments on on the retail side of things no i i also don't know how it will look um coming out of this i, I do think these retailers whether you're small or large need a uh, a dual strategy of both you know, people walking in the door plus a, a real online strategy to, to deliver those goods um, to the people if you do happen to need to close. Um, and that's the same for restaurants also needed to have a, uh, a crash course in how online ordering worked, whether that was from, uh, you know, Square, setting up a Square online site or going through Postmates or whatever it was, the people that yeah. did not have it up and running basically learned it overnight um, to set that up. Oh yeah. So I think all these places need a, a dual strategy. Um, that's just my, that's just my own opinion. But. I, I, I think you're right. I, you know, as you're saying that it kind of makes me think that you know, there's a lot of regular businesses that, you know, maybe aren't retail business to business and business to customer sales where, 
you know, maybe most of this is done over the phone or over the internet as opposed to walking into a store. But um, as we're talking about remote work and being able to not just manage your job remotely, but be able to fully and effectively do your job. So, um, you know, if I was working at an office with a desktop computer and I couldn't take that with me, well, I hope now by now I've gotten a tablet or um, I have a VPN, some sort of remote connection where I have the tools at my fingertips. And, you know, again, yeah, from a customer perspective, I think the same thing. For those who want to get back and come into a store, we have a safe methodology for that. For those of you who prefer to continue waiting, like you said, you know, establishing a, you know, reliable online, fo online footprint, storefront, right. great, great piece of advice. And that, and that could probably be applied to almost any business, Everybody. whether it's the fitness industry where you go directly or whether you have the, the second strategy of having the filmed, um, oh, yeah. the, the filmed workout, uh, whether that's an investment advisory, you bringing the documentation and having the meeting directly in front of the client and the client physically signs the documents to having Zoom meetings and doing all e-signatures. Sure, yeah. So I think having both those in whatever industry it is, having a, both an electronic strategy plus a, a personal strategy um, in case the person is not as comfortable one way or the other. Um, Absolutely, yeah, I think, we're, I think we're drawing on some pretty, pretty consistent themes here in terms of you know, the effectiveness of your communication, the agility of your business, you know, and the, the modalities through which you operate, the mediums through which consumers can reach your business. Because, yeah, as you're, as you're saying that, like, yeah, it really is every business, whether that's, the, whether that's inventory management, logistics management, vendor interface, customer interface. Like, if you're not a paperless office by now, you're probably well on the way, right. purely out of necessity. Right. So yeah, I think uh, for those like the companies who had the crash course in Zoom in mid March, like this is this is reality now, guys. You know, fight change all you want, but sometimes it just comes to your door and says, "We're here." Well, Joe, this is uh, this has been really this has been really fun, and you know, a lot of you know, very good general commentary. I think for people to hopefully feel a little more just, if nothing else, reassured that hey, everybody's going through these crazy tumultuous uncertain times um any final comments pieces of advice and then of course please tell everybody who's going to watch this if they have questions for you how do they get a hold of you sure uh final piece of advice everything's changing <laughs> all the time and just uh make sure you have some type of advisor that you could bounce ideas off of um so my name's Joe Wolterman, Ruben Brown. You can always reach me at uh, joe.wolterman at rubenbrown.com. Great. Joe, uh, we'll post your contact info along with the video uh, so that anybody who wasn't able to watch this or um, maybe doesn't have the ability to sit through the entire thing and wait for the contact info, we'll make sure, sure to distribute that to everybody as well. Um, Thank you again so much for joining us. So again, Joe Goldsman, CPA and CFA with Ruben Brown, uh, certified public accountants and consultants in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Joe, thanks a lot for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right, thank you, Matt.